Good morning, everyone. I'm Betsy Brune. I'm the director of the Smithsonian American Art Museum and the Renwick Gallery, and I am so happy to see all of you here. We have been waiting and planning and plotting, and it just feels wonderful to see faces now. And I know you're in for a spectacular week. It's going to be really remarkable. Um, the networking is, of course, lots of the fun. So I hope that you'll come away with, you know, 25 new friends all across the country. I don't suppose we have anyone here from Kansas, do we? Hmm. Can we work on that next time? <laughs> we want to be sure to do that. And our Smithsonian secretary is from Georgia. Do we have anyone here from Georgia? <gasps> Good. We'll have to tell him. Um, this idea is born of the experience that we all have working here in the museum with these fabulous artworks day in and day out, and we feel we learn so much from them. They are a window into our world. They tell us how we became the society we are today. They tell us what issues have always mattered to people. They are ways of understanding really, really complicated issues that still confound us. In fact, the really big topics are the ones that started early and persist to today, and we keep inventing new answers to persistent questions, questions like land and landscape. Who owns the land? Who manages it? What is it used for? What about public versus private? How do we decide what we're going to set aside and preserve as a park forever? What we're going to allow to be developed and how? These questions never go away. And you see it in the history of American landscape painting very, very directly. Pick any other issue you want, natural resources, creativity. We just opened a show last week. I hope you'll all have a chance to see it. We won't keep them so busy, will we, that they can't see our show, called the Great American Hall of Wonders. It's really tracing how Americans came to see themselves as a practical-minded, can-do, down-to-earth, creative and inventive people with a special genius for invention and innovation. We're hearing about that just today, aren't we? That to solve our problems, we have to be more creative the way we were in the 19th century. And I understand you just had a tour, right? You just walked through the building. You are in the home seat of American innovation right here. This is the place where the models for every single patent was on display. Everything you ever thought of, every little improvement or major new invention, the model was here. Hundreds of thousands of people came throughout the 19th century to study and learn from that example. So we love having our art collections here. It's sort of creativity by another name. And we love the symbolism of all of that. And I'm sure you heard also, let's see, did you hear about Abraham Lincoln's ball? Mm -hmm. Did you hear that Abraham Lincoln had a patent in the building? Yeah. Did you hear that he's the only patented president? Mm -hmm. Excellent. OK, you did a good job, guys. Um, we also want to stay in touch with you. I'll tell you, you're in year three of a five-year program. Our goal is to scale this program up dramatically. After the five years are up, we want to learn what we're doing right, but we also want to learn what we need to do better. So there will be assessment coming, and because we're really, really tough, we don't want to hear just the wonderful glowing things when you're all feeling emotional on the last day. We're going to check up with you six months later to see what really was useful for you. What did you find you could actually integrate into your teaching? Where did something leave a lasting lesson that you feel was transformative for you as an educator? And where really did the training, well, it was fun while I was there, but it didn't really fit with what I'm doing. We really need to learn that so that we can adjust along the way, do what we need to do to make sure that this program really serves you and really makes the transformative difference that we hope it will. So be honest when they come calling in six months and you've all settled down and you've kind of forgotten a lot. We want to know what stuck, what really mattered for you. Um, one of the innovations this year is to kick off each of our institutes with um, a keynote speaker to get us all inspired and to give us some insights right up front. 
And I really want to congratulate Eddie and Victoria for coming up with such an inspired speaker for today, who we are all excited to hear. Her name is Julie Burstein. She uh, is a longtime producer on radio, on public radio, of a series called Studio 360, which is a premier program about the arts, about popular culture. Uh, it has won a Peabody Award. It is uh, something that has allowed Julie to meet many of our country's most extraordinary artists in all media. This lady is a pro, she knows how it works. And she even put a lot of her insights together in a book, Spark, How Creativity Works, that was just published this year. Uh, it includes excerpts from interviews with a lot of these artists. And I think if we wanted someone to really help us understand this whole universe, how does a creative mind work? and how do we learn from it? She's the one. So Julie, don't let me take up any more of your time. Thanks for coming today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Betsy, and thanks also to Victoria Lichtendorf and to Adi Gayoso and also to Carlos Pariah and Melvina Martin, who are up in the booth, who are gonna be helping with all of the, the technical needs for today's talk. I am so thrilled to be here um, because when I worked for National Public Radio years ago, I used to haunt the Smithsonian. I think all my off time, I would walk down to the mall and just see things that I had never seen before. And now that I have kids, when we do come to DC, I take them everywhere and it is just so wonderful to have so many places to be provoked and to be entertained and to be surprised and also to learn something. And it sounds like already this morning you've learned quite a lot. At Studio 360, I led the creative team, including our host, um, Kurt Anderson, who you'll hear a little bit from today, for a long, long time. And then we had this wonderful opportunity to write a book. And when I sat down to think about how to write it, I thought, all right, this shouldn't just be a collection of interviews, of Q&As. What I really wanted to do was look at what does this medium allow me to do that radio doesn't? How can I look for the patterns in the stories of these artists we've interviewed hundreds over the now 11 years of the program? And it was a really wonderful challenge. It was the first time I'd ever written a book. And I learned pretty quickly as I sat down with all the transcripts how fortunate I've been in my first medium I think I always knew this, but never really thought about it, which is that in radio, we have voices to play with. And the human voice, oops, excuse me, usually I sit at the podium, but this time I wanted to try something different. So I may drop my, my folder, but we'll see. But the human voice in a split second can convey emotion in a way that I quickly learned could take paragraphs to be able to do in print. We're lucky today because through the wonders of technology, I have some of those voices with me. And so we'll get to hear some of the artists who are in Spark, including Chuck Close and the novelist Isabel Allende and the sculptor Richard Serra. And we're also so fortunate today to have works of art to look at because we have this wonderful screen to be able to see things. Now, the subtitle of my book is How Creativity Works. And at the end of the talk, I'm going to give you the secret to how it really works. <laughs> and I'm glad you laughed, because this is something that actually I've gotten into some, some trouble online. There have been some complaints of people writing and saying, because this book said How Creativity Works, I thought it was going to be a 10-point program, and by the end, I would know how to be creative. <laughs> and that just doesn't work, partly because creativity needs mystery. And in the beginning of the book, I write about a, an early interview that I did years and years ago with the playwright Peter Schaffer. You may have heard of his play and later the movie Amadeus. And this was when Amadeus had just come out, which is about the rivalry, really, between Mozart, who, thank goodness, we all remember now, and Salieri, who was hugely famous in his own time, and now, I was a classical music announcer for years, so I know Salieri, but he's not that well known now. And when I asked Peter Schaffer, what's the central difference between these two men? He said, well, 
I picture Salieri going up to the well of inspiration and putting his glasses at the end of his nose and peering over before he dips his net. He wants to see what's at the bottom. And he said the way he pictures Mozart is, there's the well, here's Mozart, headlong rush and dives in without any looking back. And I think that's a lot of what these artists talk about is that we have to become comfortable with the unknown because that's where creativity comes from. Now that said, even though we all have to find our own way to creativity, stories are the best way to learn anything. I'm sure you're all teachers, you know that, that when you tell a story that resonates with your students, suddenly something that's been complicated becomes clear. And that's what these artists do so beautifully. They share their stories of how creativity works. And in their stories, I hear key elements of how things that are different for each of them sort of come together into patterns. And that's what I would like to share with you today is these patterns that I've distilled from all of these conversations. And I really hope that these stories can work as a catalyst for you. What would delight me is if after this morning, you found yourself looking around you at the things that are familiar. Although today you're in an unfamiliar place, so maybe it's at, at the things that are unfamiliar. And then going back to your home and your classroom and seeing things that you've so seen every single day and suddenly they look different or you see something new in them. One of the first things that I heard over and over in these interviews was about the essential nature of being able to attend to the world around you, that so many of these artists talked about an experience or a place or something that was unexpected that ended up changing them and changing their work. And because you work with young people, I wanted to begin today with some stories from artists who continue to reach back to experiences from childhood for their work. And I'm thinking first of the wonderful artist William Christenberry, whose work is well represented in the Smithsonian's collection. Here's a picture that he took in 1971 of a church in Sprott, Alabama. And Christenberry grew up in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, not very far from here. But his grandparents on both sides lived on farms just south of the city in Hale County. And he spent summers there as a kid. That's where he would spend a month with one set of grandparents and a month with the other. And he says that his work has <laughs> deep roots in what he calls the landscape of his childhood. Since the late 60s, when he left Alabama, he's made annual pilgrimages to Hale County. And he's really captured the spirit of that landscape, often visiting the same exact buildings or the same vistas year after year to see how they've changed. And here we can see that in this image from 1964. This is a building in Hale County that he called the Palmist Building. And I think we can see it says Palmist, and it's, I guess that's the sign for palm reading. And then he went back year after year, and here it is in 1980. So his pictures are like time lapse, not over you know, the course of a flower blooming, but over the course of decades of a place changing. Now, he left Alabama as a young man, first going to New York to seek his fortune as a painter. But while he was in New York, he met the great photographer Walker Evans, who was also from Alabama, and they became great friends. And Evans once came to his little tiny apartment and said, I want to see your work. And he had a bunch of paintings, but he also had these little photographs of the places that he painted. He would take little snapshots and then paint from that. And Walker Evans looked at the snapshots and said, you have something here. You're, you have an extraordinary eye. You need to follow this. And he said, I was as interested at that point in f photographs as I was in physics, really pretty nothing. But with this champion of saying, this is where you should think you should go, this is where he ended up. And he still makes paintings and he makes sculpture, but photographs have been his major focus. After New York, he went to the Corcoran and he's taught there for many, many years. And so he's lived away from Alabama for much longer 
then he lived there. But he says it's essential to his work that he left where he grew up. If I lived there, I don't know if I would see it as clearly. And as it's seen in my work, so often going back to the same places time after time and watching them decay or change or disappear. I find it so interesting that he understood that it was important to kind of put his roots down in one place and know that his roots were still there but leave because the only way to understand it was to look from another perspective. And I think that that is one way that creativity works, is you need to take in what's around you, but then you sometimes need distance to be able to really see it and understand it. Another artist who's followed a passion that was born in childhood is David Plowden. And he's published many, many books of his pictures of America. He has, some of the introductions are by the historian David McCullough, who has said that Plowden's photographs of small towns like this, this is Marion uh, Baustian in Guernsey, Iowa from 1986. And this is Van's clothing store uh, in Victor, Iowa. But David Plowden says that these photographs of small towns and of industry, this is slagging ingots in Chicago, Indiana, and also of bridges, that these photographs, to quote McCulloch, confer a kind of immortality on certain aspects of American civilization before they vanish. And this is Market Street, Market Street Bridge in Susquehanna, uh, Pennsylvania, and actually in, in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. But a very early passion for David Plowden was trains. And he talks about how he traces it to his family traveling from New York City to Putney, Vermont every summer when he was a kid by train. And we hear him talk about getting his very first camera and he knew exactly what he wanted to photograph. Well, the first picture I ever made was when I was 11 and that was a picture of the train coming into the station in Putney. Well, the first time I went to photograph it, I got buck fever and I handed the camera to my mother and said, here, you take it. I started to shake. Well, the next time I went down, I was, I was steadier, and so I managed to get a picture. I still have it. And I can imagine, you look at these huge trains. This is probably the 1940s when he got his camera. Bellowing smoke. I can understand an 11-year-old being so anxious about it that he hands the camera to his mom. What I love about it is the next day, he took his own picture, and he's been taking pictures ever since. He went on to boarding school, which he says he hated. In fact, he ran away. And then on to Yale, where he studied business. And I think his family hoped he would become a captain of industry, even if the industry was trains. And he did go and get a job at the railroad, but his job was riding the rails, going out all over the United States. And that was a bit of a problem. I rode all over the place. And to the despair of my uncles and aunts and my mother's friends who said, what, what's she going to amount to? He just rides trains. And um, she said, I don't know what he's doing, but he does. Leave him alone. He's gathering grist for the mill. And she was my champion. I love that story. As a mother, I think about it when, I, when my kids come to me and say, I really want to do this, and I think, oh my god. And then I think, well, you know, this may be their gathering grist for the mill. And as teachers, I see you nodding your head. This is probably something you encounter all the time. And thank goodness that David Plowden's mother knew that her son needed to follow his heart, because he has gone on to eloquently capture the spirit of our country in his photographs. For so many artists, there was this particular call to attention as a child, and they respond in a very powerful way. The filmmaker Mira Nair's story also says something about the capacity to take in what experience presents to us. Now, Mira Nair grew up in a place very different from this. This is Bhubaneswar, India, a small provincial town, 
and she played in the streets with her brother. She was a passionate reader, but this really was the landscape she grew up in. In this little town, there were like 2,000 temples. We played cricket all the time. We kind of grew up in the rubble. Uh, the major thing that inspired me, that led me on this path, that made me a filmmaker eventually, was traveling folk theater that would come through the town. And I would t go off and see this great battles of good and evil by two people in a school field with no props, but with a lot of you know, passion and hashish as well. And it was just... Passion and hashish? Passion and hashish, yeah. Everyone was stoned out of their heads. And <laughs> it was amazing. You know, the folk tales of Mahabharata and Ramayana, the two holy books, the epics uh, that everything comes out of in India, they say. After seeing that Jatra, the folk theater, I knew I wanted to uh, get on, you know, and perform. I love that image of young Mira Naira, I think she was 12 or 13, in this field watching this performance with all the passion and hashish and being completely overwhelmed. And what I find really striking is she shared that experience with thousands of other people. All the people in this town saw that same performance. But Mira Nair was open to it and she paid keen attention to what other people took for granted and allowed it to spark in her this passion for performance and later for becoming a director and creating worlds that we can enter into when we go to see her movies. Her first feature film was Salam Bombay and it was about a little boy. This is the video cover and you can see him looking at a young girl in a car and it really is about what this boy sees on the streets of Bombay. And it is an extraordinary film and the beginning of a very powerful career. And in each shot that Krishna, this little boy, is in, you can see in his eyes what it is that he sees all around him. So many of the stories in Spark that these artists tell speak of a need to stop and to look, whether it's extraordinary pageantry like Mira Nair saw in, in this performance or the heartbreaking things that Krishna sees on the street. Some of these things are full of wonder and others are terrifying. The video artist Bill Viola creates work that's full of elemental forces. This is a still from one of his works called The Crossing at the Dallas Museum of Art where he works with fire and he also works with water. And there's an, ex there's an exhibition upstairs called Watch This on the third floor, and it includes a Bill Viola video on loan, and I'd encourage you to go and take a look at that. Now, in his work, and in Spark, he describes an event that happened to him when he was a very little boy that he believes has influenced all of his work. So I want you to picture this. It's Trout Lake, New York. It's in the Adirondacks. It's 1958, probably. It's a summer day. And Bill Viola is about six years old, and he's on vacation with all of his cousins and his aunts and uncles and his parents. And he's in the middle of the lake on a raft, and he jumps in. But he forgets to hold on to his inner tube. And he says he sank to the bottom of the lake like a stone. After, I don't know how much time, my uncle dove in and grabbed me and saved me and pulled me up and I was sputtering and crying. But I had glimpsed another world that had stayed with me for my whole life and, and it's, it's something that, I mean, I can still see it now and feel it. It's, it was the most peaceful experience I ever had. It was a place that I wanted to stay in. I had absolutely no fear, even though I was drowning. And it was something I guess I'd always tried to get back to for the rest of my life. And, and I do that, I guess, through, through all this water imagery. He also does it through the ideas that he explores. He talks a lot about how so much of his work is looking at what he sees as the permeable borderline between life and death. He's done a very moving video about his mother's death and his son's birth, which happened at about the same time. And he talks in Spark about a work that he created in 2007 for Venice, for a small chapel in Venice called Ocean Without a Shore. 
And in this chapel, there are three different altars. It's a very small, dark chapel. And we're going to see a little bit from a Tate Modern video of Bill Viola talking, and we'll see a little bit of his video um, called Ocean Without a Shore. Each one is separate individual. Shows a series of people, one by one, coming towards us from a very dark, obscure place. The image is black and white. And they pass through this invisible threshold in the form of a wall of water, which is so clear and transparent you can't see it. And then they actually step into seemingly this space and they become at that moment transformed into a high definition, highly detailed, full color image. when he did this. So there are three screens, and you see people, and it's very mysterious and strange. And they come, and they're sort of, some of them are just so shocked and happy to be, in a sense, back in the world of the living. And the heartbreaking part, of course, is that they all have to turn around and go back. And it really is, uh, you know, for those of you who know the Orpheus myth, it pulls from that, that idea that you can go back and forth, but not for very long. What I find striking about all of these stories is you just don't know what's going to catch a child's imagination. As a parent, as teachers, you know, we present so much to these young people, and it may be something that they discover completely on their own, but if they can retain that openness, it'll go in and it may then spark things that, that feed them for the rest of their lives. Some artists talk about a particular moment that, you know, for Bill Viola, this really led to a whole body of work. Other artists talk about something that happened that works their way into one particular, in, in this case, novel. The novelist Richard Ford tells a story in Spark about how in his latest novel, The Lay of the Land, he created this scene where um, his protagonist has gone to the Jersey Shore to watch the demolition of a hotel because this other character is fascinated by hotels imploding. And as he's standing there with this older guy watching this, uh, this hotel fall in on itself in Asbury Park, suddenly this memory from childhood comes to mind of watching his mother run over the family cat when he was a little boy. And it turns out the exact same thing happened to Richard Ford when he was about six years old. He was growing up in Mississippi, and he says that he watched his mom out their big plate glass picture window back out of the driveway right over their new kitten named Mittens, leaving him home alone with the animal in its death throes. And I picked the little cat up, and I ran next door where there was this old Civil War veteran. And I ran up to him, and I said, Colonel something or other, I said, my cat, my cat's been run over. And he was, of course, adulpated as could be. He said to me, mm, he said, I think you've got a Persian there. He said, but I, looks like something's wrong with it. <laughs> I've known that story all my life. It's just, but I haven't ever thought that it would ever find its way into anything I wrote. I would sometimes tell it to people, told it to people for decades. Suddenly a moment comes in the middle of, in the middle of this book that it seemed to fit in perfectly, and there it was. So this idea of attending to the world around you, of being open to experience, is one way that creativity works. It's something that seems to come so naturally to the artists who tell stories in Spark, but I think it's getting harder and harder to do, partly because we're all so distracted by our various electronic toys, um, and I'm thinking about my children too, and, Sometimes I know with my kids, we'll be on a car trip and they'll be playing their things in the back of the car and I'll say, put them away and just look out the window because that's what's important. And they usually get really annoyed with me and then say, oh, I didn't realize that this was out there. So it's, it takes work, but I think it's so essential, not just for the kids, but for all of us. Now, Richard Ford writes these beautiful, languorous sentences and his novel, Independence Day, won the Pulitzer Prize. 
And he gives us another insight into how creativity works. He describes something that we hear from many artists in this book, how engaging with the deepest challenges that are presented, rather than running away from them, actually forges who you become. For Richard Ford, it was a childhood challenge. He talks about how excruciating reading was for him as a kid because he was severely dyslexic. I was slow to learn to read. Went all the way through school not really reading more than the minimum. And still to this day can't read silently much faster than I can read aloud. Um, but there were, a lot of, there were a lot of benefits to being dyslexic for me because when I finally did reconcile myself to how slow I was gonna have to do it, then I think I came very slowly into an appreciation of all those qualities of language and of sentences that are not just the cognitive aspects of language, the syncopations, the sounds of words, what words look like, where paragraphs break, where lines break. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't so badly dyslexic that I, was, that I was disabled from reading. I just had to do it really slowly. And as I did, lingering on those sentences as I had to linger, I fell heir to languages, other qualities, which I think has helped me write sentences. That is so powerful. He says the benefits of being dyslexic. I know I have a child with learning issues, and often I think, how is he going to you know, get through this next thing? And hearing this, I thought, maybe that's what will create this new vision of the world that the rest of us don't have, because these are the things that, he, that this is the way he sees the world. And so for Richard Ford, being dyslexic wasn't just a challenge to overcome, it actually becomes a source of strength. It leads him to understand the poetic aspects of language because, as he says, he needed to linger on them. And we're then the beneficiaries of that because we get to linger on his beautiful sentences. There are so many stories from artists about how their deepest challenge was really the growing edge of their work. And I know, personally, the urge when you face a challenge is often to run away, but these artists take these challenges head on. And I didn't mean to make a pun, but that is literally true for painter Chuck Close. We're looking right now at his self-portrait from 2000, and it's here, actually, in the Smithsonian collection. And Chuck Close was one of those kids who knew really early on that he wanted to be an artist. By the time he was five, he asked his dad if he could make him an easel. And by eight, he was painting with a teacher from a nude model, which made him the envy of all of the kids in his neighborhood. But for Close, art wasn't just fun. It was also his main way to connect. I think I learned early on that uh... Since I also wasn't athletic and uh, I couldn't run or catch a ball or throw a ball, that I needed to do something to keep people around me. So I began doing magic acts and puppet shows, and I began to realize that one of the things that I could do that my friends couldn't do uh, was draw. And uh, I was lucky enough to have the support of my family and and uh, to to feel like I had something to say, even though I didn't say it in the uh, traditional way. I was uh, learning disabled, although in the 40s and 50s, nobody knew from learning disabilities. I was just dumb. His is sort of a cautionary tale as, as parents, as educators. You know, he was this kid with these undiagnosed challenges. And by the time he got to eighth grade, they were so profound that his eighth grade teacher said, don't even think about college, Chuck. You should go the vocational route. And this is a man who did go on to get his MFA from Yale. So he didn't listen to that teacher. And he says in order to succeed, he really had to allow his disabilities to shape both what he painted and how he painted. He has something called prosopognosia, which is face blindness. If you meet him and have a conversation with him and then run into him on the street the next day, he will not recognize you because he cannot remember faces in three dimensions. But by painting them, by committing them to two dimensions, suddenly he can hold on to them. So most of the people that he painted early on 
were family and friends. And so it was partly they were the people around to paint and partly as a way of holding on to them. He also has a tremendous difficulty thinking about the whole. And he has to break everything down into pieces. And you can see here, this is a, a portrait. And you can tell it's a face, but the way that he builds it. And he says he builds paintings. He doesn't paint paintings. He breaks it down through a grid. For the beginning of his career, the grid was um, up and down. And then later, he started turning it at 90 degrees to create what he calls this pinking shears around the edges. But when you go close up, suddenly, uh, you know, what is this? You can't really tell. What's remarkable about his way of painting, though, is he can. He paints from about this far away. And as an adult, he faced even more serious challenges in that when he was in his 40s, he had a spinal aneurysm and is now paralyzed from the neck down. He has to paint with brushes taped to his wrists. But as a friend said, after this, what Close calls the event, painting saved his life because the first thing he wanted to do was figure out, how do I paint again? And he says he's in a wheelchair, but the place he feels the most like he did before was painting because he always sat down to paint. And so when he's there with a canvas, and he sits about this far away from the canvas, and he knows what the entire canvas will look like, even though he may only focus on an area that this big. For most of us, we need to go back and forth and back and forth, but he understands the whole through these pieces, and that, again, was part of what his learning disability was. And he has something to say about, about this being overwhelmed by the whole. Also, part of my learning disability was being overwhelmed by the whole, and uh, I found it to be uh, particularly uh, helpful to, to use a grid to, uh, to isolate one small piece that I could work on and forget about the rest of the picture. But at a certain point in my work, I began to let the grid show uh, and to leave it as part of the picture. His early work, he was, he hates this term, but he was called a, a photorealist because when you look at the early portraits, they look like a giant photograph but it really was done with a tiny, tiny grid. And here, he lets the grid show. And he talks about how using a grid is really nothing new. This is a technique that goes back thousands of years. I was recently living in Rome. And uh, I was looking at the uh, humble Roman floor mosaics. And uh, there, the viewing distance is the height of of the viewer. You look down at the floor. And there, uh, there's a floor made up of chunks of stone. And uh, just when you are get used to looking at the chunks of stone on that flat surface, it warps into a, an animal or a head or whatever. And just when you're comfortable looking at the animal or a head, uh, it flattens back out and insists on being seen as a flat floor made up chunks of stone. And the wonderful thing is that across the centuries, it's as if I'm looking over the shoulder of the artisan who made that floor, uh, and I can see the record of the thought process that he used, uh, where he chipped a little corner off the stone and nudged it in, and three or four or five or six of those stones become a piece of a face or an eyeball or something. Uh, it's, uh, it's something that, that you instantly, the viewer can instantly uh, understand as a, um, as a, as a process. And he feels very strongly that he wants us to see that process, too, in his own work. And in Studio 360 years ago, we actually had a story by a neuroscientist who was in a museum looking at a Chuck Close. And this neuroscientist studied how we recognize shapes and letters. And he suddenly had this brilliant flash of, Chuck Close understands things that we as scientists don't even know about focal distance and about how you have to stand at a particular distance for the pieces to come together as a whole. So there's also this wonderful back and forth in Close's work, and I think in a lot of this work, that is about different disciplines, not just art. Now, with these kinds of challenges that we're talking about, that 
The challenges can come in childhood and can be things that kids need to engage with and work through and understand how it shapes who they are. These kinds of challenges, though, are also things that we need to embrace at different times in our lives. In order for creativity to flourish, we need to confront things like loss and suffering. And we look to artists to stand in what the educator Parker Palmer calls the tragic gap. Not tragic sad, but tragic inevitable, to hold the tension between what we see in the world, what we experience, and what we hope the world could be. A good friend of mine, the leadership coach, Dick Nodell, talks about this tension like a violin string. You know, if you've ever played a stringed instrument, you know if the string is too loose, you have no sound. If the string is too tight, it snaps. It has to be at just that right tension for the song in the instrument to come out. And I look at what these artists are doing as the same thing. They are holding that tension between reality and what we hope for in a way that can create something beautiful or powerful. Sometimes it's not beautiful, sometimes it's ugly and rending, but it moves us. And you can see this tension in the work of the playwright Lynn Nottage. She won a Pulitzer in 2009 for her play Ruined, and it's about women in the Democratic Republic of Congo who have been brutalized in their ongoing civil war. This kind of material has the really easy danger of turning into a polemic. But Nottage was able to take this emotionally charged story and create something very complicated and powerful out of it, a play that's full of the brutality and despair that the Civil War has, has brought up in this country, but also full of music and jokes and hope. And in Spark, she talks about how she really was determined to portray the awful truths of war, but also the humor and compassion of the people there. I wanted to look at the human side. I was really interested in what happens to the human spirit and how does love continue to flourish in, in the face of such ugliness and brutality. In order to discover that, she had to open herself to experience. She felt she had to go as close to the Congo as she could. So she went to Uganda, where a lot of these women were flowing over the border to escape. And she found these women eager to tell her their stories, which surprised her because these stories were terrible about rape and murder. But she said, they told her, no one has listened to us tell these stories from beginning to end. The aid workers want to know just enough to decide what to give us and to do with us, but Nottage listened. And from these interviews, and here is a picture of Lynn Nottage is all the way on the right, and her director, Kate Wariski, is there with some of these women. From these interviews, Nottage developed her characters such as a young woman named Salima, who is based on this woman here. Salima, and here's a photo from the Manhattan Theater Club performance of Ruined. That's where it was performed in New York. Salima is the one on the right with her nose buried in a magazine. And this is in a brothel, and they are all working as prostitutes. But Salima, with her friends, talks about the last day of her real life, when she was at home before she was abducted by soldiers. And she was working in her garden one day with her baby playing by her side. The sun was about to crest, but I had to put in another hour before it got too hot. It was such a clear and open sky. Oh, this splendid bird, a peacock, had come into the garden to taunt me and was showing off its feathers. I stooped down and called to the bird, st, st, and I felt a shadow cut across my back. And when I stood, four men were there over me, smiling, wicked schoolboy smiles. Yes, I said, and the tall soldier slammed the butt of his gun into my cheek. 
just like that. It was so quick, I didn't even know I'd fallen to the ground. Where did they come from? How could I not have had them? One of the things also in that moment I was conjuring, I was just thinking of, of 9-11 on that day, which was just such a clear, beautiful, absolutely perfect, pristine day, and how suddenly our lives can be changed so absolutely in a moment. That is the tragic gap, and I think we all felt that on 9-11. And it's fascinating to hear Lynn Nottage talk about her own experience sitting in Brooklyn when the towers were attacked, and then thinking about experiences of people all over the world when the world can change, as she says, in an instant. In Spark, I write about the photographer Joel Myrowitz, who spent nine months photographing the World Trade Center site after the towers were attacked. Before 9-11, he was known for his really extraordinary street photography. This is a picture from the 70s of a woman cutting a man's hair that he just happened upon. He also has published exquisite books of landscapes and light, often focusing on water and land. This is an image from his book, Bay Light. He lived for many, many years up in Provincetown in, on Cape Cod. But he is a New Yorker, and even though he had a studio in Provincetown, he always kept a studio in New York. And for many years, his studio was right uptown from the World Trade Center. He was in the 20s, and he would just take pictures of the buildings in any sort of light. And one September day, he took a picture of the World Trade Center, and it wasn't very interesting, and he thought, but I'll be back. And that was September 5th, 2001. He was in his studio in Provincetown when he heard about the attacks, and he immediately tried to get back to New York. It took him a few days, but finally he was able to get into the city, and a few days after the towers were destroyed, he went down to the World Trade Center site. And like all the other passerby, I stood outside the chain link fence on Chambers in Greenwich, and all I could see was the smoke and a little bit of rubble. And I raised my camera to take a peek, just to see if there was something to see, and some cop, a, a lady cop, hit me on my shoulder and said, hey, no pictures. And it was such a blow that it woke me up in, that, in the way that it was meant to be, I guess. And uh, when I asked her why no pictures, she said, it's a, it's a crime scene, no photographs allowed. And, and I asked her what would happen if I was a member of the press. And she told me, oh, look back, look back there. And back a block was the press corps tied up in a little penned-in area. And I said, well, when do they go in? And she said, probably never. And as I walked away from that, I had this crystallization, probably from the blow, because it was an insult in a way. I thought, oh, if there's no pictures, then there'll be no record. And so we need a record. And I thought, I'm going to make that record. I'll find a way to get in, because I don't want to see this, this history disappear. And he did. He called everyone he knew, and he knew the parks commissioner, and the parks commissioner got him one pass to get in for one day. And when he was in the site that one day, he saw that there were different color passes, and he went back the next day and he saw, oh, it's exactly the same pass, but it's just photocopied on different color paper. And so he went out and got construction paper and photographed every single color pass, and he would just look around and say, oh, it's blue day, and he would pull his blue pass out of his bag and go into the site. And after a while, the workers who, you know, he understands the drama and the real terror of this place, but he also understands that it was people who changed it. And so his work in his book called Aftermath is as much about the men and women who cleared the site as it is about the destruction that was there. And there was one squad of, um, of men who were the, I think the arson and explosive squad, and they kind of adopted him, and whenever he had trouble getting in, they brought him in. And his story about that crystallization, knowing a record must be made, and that he was going to do it, illustrates another way that creativity works, which is you have to have 
what I like to call a persistent obstinacy. You have to be able to look at all the no's that you're going to get when you want to do something new or something that people are saying you can't do and say, I hear you, but I'm going to try and do it anyway. Recently, I had a chance to talk with Joel Meyerowitz, and when I told him about this idea of persistent obstinacy, he said, yep, I do have that, but I also have what I call a persistent optimism. And I loved that, that it's not just that he was going to push back, but that it came from this optimism of, this needs to be done, and I'm going to do it. Looking at these photos today, they can still make me weep. I look at these pictures. This is of a daycare center that was evacuated safely, but I used to walk by this because I commuted into the city from New Jersey, often by ferry through the World Trade Center, and walk by this thriving daycare every morning. And these photos bring back to me viscerally the smell of smoke on my clothes, which lingered for months because WNYC was just a few blocks away. So I would go home to my own kids and immediately take my clothes off before I would hug them because I smelled like smoke. And I still remember walking by the site and saying the Kaddish, which is the Jewish prayer for the dead, every day for months and months and months. But some of his images are also incredibly beautiful. And when we had him into Studio 360, just a few months after 9-11, Kurt Anderson said, Is, does it make you uncomfortable to make such beautiful pictures out of such devastation? Well, you know, ugly, I mean, powerful and tragic and horrific and everything, but um, it was also, as in nature, an enormous event that was transformed uh, after the fact, into the, this residue. And like many other ruins, you go to the ruins of the Colosseum or the ruins of a cathedral someplace, and they take on a new meaning when you watch the weather. I mean, there were afternoons I was down there, and the light goes pink, and there's a mist in the air, and you're standing in the rubble, and I found myself recognizing both the inherent beauty of nature and the fact that nature as time is erasing this wound. Time is unstoppable and it transforms the event. It gets further and further away from the day and light and seasons temper it in some way. And, and it's, it's not that I'm a romantic, it's that the reality, I mean, I'm really a realist, the reality is there's the Woolworth building, you know, um, in a veil of smoke from the, from the site, but it's now like a scrim across a, 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 th a theater, and it's turning pink, you know, and down below there are hoses spraying, and the lights have come on for the evening, and, and the water is turning acid green because the sodium lamps are on. And I'm thinking, my God, who could dream this up? But the fact is, I'm there, it looks like that, you have to take a picture. You have to take a picture. There is that sense of inevitability that so many artists talk about, of the need to make art, the need to take on, as Meyerowitz did, the, the most difficult parts of our lives. Creativity can take on destruction like this. It can't change it, but the work that comes out of it can change us because someone like Joel Meyerowitz was willing to stand in that tragic gap and be persistent and obstinate and optimistic. We really need artists to embrace what's the hardest for us. Loss, that earliest and most constant and most difficult of human experiences. On the first anniversary of 9-11, we brought the poet Donald Hall into Studio 360 because the poems that he wrote after his wife, the poet Jane Kenyon, died are some of the most powerful of his very long career. These poems are unflinching in the portrayal of illness and death and mourning, 
but they're also funny and sharp and deeply human. We get to listen to him now read a poem from the first year after her death, which is called Her Garden. My late wife, Jane Kenyon, is a poet, uh, was uh, a gardener of great passion. And she died in April. The flowers started to come up. They're still coming up in diminished form. I wrote the poem, Her Garden. I let her garden go, let it go, let it go. How can I watch the hummingbird hover to sip with its beak's tip the purple bee balm whirring as we heard it years ago? The weeds rise rank and thick, let it go, let it go. Where annuals grew and burdock grows, where standing she yet once could see the peony, the lily, and the rose rise over brick she'd laid in patterns, moss, let it go, let it go, turns the bricks green, softening them by the gray rocks where hollyhocks that lofted while she lived, stem by tall stem, dwindle in loss. Donald Hall has been writing poems since he was about 12 years old, and he's now in his, I think, late 80s. He was just given the National Medal of Arts this past spring here in Washington, D.C. And he told us that he often includes these poems of Jane Kenyon's death and his mourning afterwards when he gives readings, which, as he says, that's the way poets earn their living now, as you go out and you give readings. And he says, inevitably, at, at his readings, people come up to him and say, how can you read that poem aloud? How can you do that? He says he has no problem with that. I have no difficulty reading them aloud. They have become poems. They start out as uh, screams of pain, and as I work on them, uh, they, they will come to be something outside me. It is as if I were working with a, hacking away at a piece of stone to make sculpture, or modeling, or trying to paint, adding a little paintbrush here and there, adding a little dash of this and that, uh, so that they become works of art. They become a work of art in the art that I love, that I've tried to practice since I was 12 years old. Uh, then they are objectified, they're out there, they start from the pain, they start from the anguish, these poems do, and then they become something that means to be in itself as language, as sound, as imagery, objects of pleasure, objects that give pleasure. In Spark, Donald Hall, and this is Donald Hall standing in front of the house in New Hampshire that was his grandparents' house that's been lived in by Halls for more than a century. And I think you can see some of his wife's garden dwindling there. Um, but he talks about how there's an inherent paradox in poetry that so often the subject is defeat or death or loss. And that even in triumph, the poems of triumph of winning a war, there's loss in there too. And yet, he says, these poems turn the raw material of grief into an object of beauty. The poems don't change the death that is spoken of, but transform it into something that then feeds the rest of us. And I'm so grateful for these artists like Donald Hall, who when the world is shattered, pick up those pieces and create something, put them back together for us. We may see the seams where the shards are fastened together, but that's part of the point. Now, Donald Hall talks also about how work itself was transformative for him. After Jane Kenyon's death, writing the poems that became the book Without, this work allowed him to stop and look at what had happened to her and also what had happened to him. In Without, at one point, I'm talking to my dog before I sit down in the morning to work on my poems, and I say to him in a kind of manic glee, Poetry Man is suiting up. <laughs> and that's how I felt. And for that first year after Janie died, I uh, could work on, on the poems of Without for a couple of hours, perhaps. And then I had 
22 miserable hours to wait until I could get back to them again because I can't work on poetry all day. Uh, but the two hours were the only hours of uh, happiness uh, at that time. So ritual, the ritual of writing was healing for him. And I have to say, I would love that poetry man figure. I wish my kids had had it when they were little. That would have been great. Um, so this is another piece of how creativity works. Rituals play many different roles in the way these artists do their work. The novelist Isabel Allende has a very different story from Donald Hall. She talks about starting a new book every year on the exact same day because on January 8th, I'm not sure how many years ago, she began a letter to her grandfather who was dying. She was not in Chile and he was living there and she couldn't go back. So she started this letter that soon became a 400 page manuscript that she lugged around in a shopping bag and she said, I realized pretty quickly it wasn't actually a letter and my grandfather actually died and I kept writing and it turned into her book, The House of the Spirits, which became her a big bestseller. And so after that, she started a new book every year on January 8th. And when she came into Studio 360, it was almost January 8th. I think it was December. And this is what she had to say. I haven't finished the one that I started this year, but I'm going to start another book all the same. Because if I don't start on January 8th, I will probably not write it. I want to start something and then finish what I'm doing and then go back to the, to the book that I will start next year. But, but I'm still doubting, doubting about what that, what that book will be about. Can you imagine what January 7th is like in my life? <laughs> yes, I think we all can imagine what January 7th is like. And, you know, not everyone needs to have as profound a ritual as this. You know, this is the day I start something new. But so many artists talked about things that allowed them to do their work. The artist Chuck Close talks about how inspiration is for amateurs and the rest of us to just get up and get to work. This is another piece from the Smithsonian collection of um, the composer Philip Glass. Close says that if you wait for the clouds to part and for inspiration to strike, you may be waiting the rest of your life. But if you just get going, something will occur to you. So for him, the ritual is just do it. Just keep working. And that's excellent advice for some people, but others have a completely different way of organizing the way that they work. The novelist Joyce Carol Oates says that she doesn't begin writing until the entire thing has kind of formed itself in her head like a movie. And then the work that she does is take dictation from her imagination and try to put into words what she has dreamed for all that time. And the sculptor Richard Serra talks about the essential importance of play, of trying things out without worrying about what the result will be. Early on in his move from painting to sculpture, because Sarah was initially a painter, when Philip Glass actually was his studio assistant, Richard Sarah found out that a rubber factory near his studio in, um, in downtown New York was going out of business, and he called up the president of the factory and said, is there anything I could have? And the guy said, whatever you can take away is yours. And so Sarah and Close and a number of other artists were working as movers by day and working as artists when they could, and they just brought their moving truck up to the factory and put in as much rubber as they could take away and brought it to Richard Serra's studio. So he had huge rolls of rubber, and instead of thinking, all right, what could I do with this rubber? What do I want it to look like? He said, I put together a list of verbs of what can I do to this rubber? How could I play with it? What are the different things I could do? So things like to cut, to fold, to uh, curl, and by his fourth one, to lift, he came up with this. He just took a large sheet of, of rubber and he lifted up the center, and he said, I returned to it day after day and realized I could put my name on this one. And this one is now in the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. So this idea, not of what is the end result, but 
what can I do to play with this, is key for him. And he also has a story about something else that I think is an essential part of how creativity works, that you have to take a break when you're stuck. In Spark, he describes what it was like to work all day in his studio with Philip Glass and how they found almost every afternoon they got stuck. They hit what they called the four o'clock problem, which I think all of us, and your teachers, it may hit a little earlier than four o'clock, but I think this is something anybody who, who works hard can understand that at a certain point you get stuck. And so they developed a ritual for how to deal with that. We'd get on the ferry or we'd get on a subway because we found that if we took ourselves out of the studio and got into a, a space where you didn't have to walk and you were being transported, that actually um, ideas were exchanged more rapidly. So we used to take ferry boat rides. Sounds uh -huh. strange, but we did. Or we used to get on the subway and just ride back and forth and then go back to the studio just to get ourselves in a different mindset. A lot of artists talk about that, about the need to get away from the thing that is the most perplexing that you can't figure it out when it's right in front of you, but sometimes, suddenly, when you've pulled away from it, it will come to you. Joyce Carol Oates talks about when she's stuck, she goes running. And so it, I found it interesting, too, that there were a lot of stories about not just the need to pull away to go to your computer screen, but to get outside and to go experience something that's very different, in a sense, for visual artists, too, I think, I think probably for all of us, to have a different focal distance you may be sitting like this from your work and you go outside and suddenly you can look far away. It is so important to take a break. Another way that creativity works is through collaboration, like Richard Serra and Philip Glass. And partnerships offer particular challenges that need to be engaged with and understood. Many artists who collaborate talk about the real need to allow room for conflict because that friction is what actually moves the work forward. Conflict is inherent in collaboration, and it doesn't just mean fighting. It means any time when you have two different perspectives or point of, points of view in tension with each other. And the power of that particular tension is beautifully described by the architects Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown, who are in Spark. And you may know them for one of their iconic buildings or for their iconic book, Learning from Las Vegas. The two of them have worked together and lived together for more than 40 years. They got married in a wonderful ceremony in the 1960s, 1967. And so this is them in 1967, here they are, today, and they talk about how they've sustained such a strong partnership. And they both have very strong personalities, but it's this remarkable partnership, both personal and professional. And Robert Venturi said it's probably best described by something T.S. Eliot wrote about creativity among artists. And he points out that the creative process consisted enormously of critique, of being a critic wasn't so much that you were inventing all the time, but that you were getting an idea and then you were critiquing the idea and then you were trying it out and then you worked as a critic towards your own ideas. And so I think Denise and I share that idea and we work very much in to, uh, as critics uh, when there's a, a project that is more on Denise's side, I am a critic and, she, and critique it and vice versa. And I think that's an interesting way of putting it. I th think we can also jumpstart some processes by um, capping each other's ideas and batting the ideas around between us, sometimes fighting over them, and they get more intense. And sometimes it happens that I say to Rob, look, I just don't think this is working this way. It's, he says, of course it's working. And I say, well, couldn't you think of such and such? He says, no, no, you can't do that. And then a day or so later he said, well, you know, you remember what you said? Well, look what I did. I find that story so wonderful. I, I loved hearing the two of them talk about art and life and how they've worked it together. And hearing her say, sometimes we fight about it. And later she talked about how, you know, they run a very large architectural practice 
And she said it can be uncomfortable for the other people in the room to see the two of them arguing. And sometimes the other associates will come up and say, well, I think I can solve this problem. And she'll say, I don't want it solved. We have to leave it open to be able to figure out what's going to come next. And so it is being able to live with that discomfort of something not being reconciled, and also of the fact that conflict is sometimes essential for moving something forward. The two of them also, though, talked about life in a family, and Denise Scott Brown had one of the best pieces of advice, I think, for any of us in whatever we do, and that is don't talk about something important when you're hungry. <laughs> and their story made me think about my own, which is what I'll leave you with. I, I also met my husband through work. It's a very public radio story. Those of you who listen to public radio have probably had to live through a lot of fund drives. And Mark and I met pitching all things considered and Prairie Home Companion, and so being on the air asking for money. And then we worked together. He, I was a, an announcer, and he was doing the promos for my show. And I found that he was incredibly creative in the way that Robert Venturi and Denise Scott Brown talked about. He would bring an idea, and I would say, I'm not sure that works. What about this? And he would go away and come back with something I never would have thought of. And so when we married, I knew that he was this incredibly creative guy and that we were going to be able to work together creatively. What I didn't realize was how essential that was going to be, not in the kind of pleasurable parts of our lives, but in the most difficult pieces of our lives. We got married 18 years ago, and about, I guess now, six years ago, our youngest son became very, very ill. And he was hospitalized, and the doctors were saying he was going to need life-altering surgery, that the medication wasn't going to work, and that was the only thing we were going to be able to do. And while our son was in the hospital, Mark and I frantically researched what else for this condition might be possible. And we discovered that there were approaches that involved diet, that involved acupuncture and osteopathy, these alternative ways of approaching it. And we came to his doctor and said, what if we tried this? And the doctor said, I'll give you a couple of months, but I really don't have much hope that anything except surgery is going to work. I am so happy to report to you today that two years ago, four years after he first fell ill, we brought our son to the doctor, and the doctor said, I don't know what you're doing, but keep it up, because there is no evidence through the blood tests of illness anymore. And it's just so hard for me to imagine this outcome had I not known that I could have come to Mark and said, what if we try this? And I knew that, it always chokes me up, that Mark, in the midst of a crisis, would throw his whole creative self into figuring out how we could address this. So creativity is not just the territory of artists. It's something we all need in our lives. There are so many elements to how creativity works, and each of us has to combine them in our own way. I find such inspiration from the truthful, courageous stories of these artists who confront and engage with challenges and work with it the way all of us have to work with the difficult parts of our own lives. So as I promised in the beginning, I'm going to give you the five key things of how creativity works to end. And I think as teachers, you're already doing this. I think about the first thing that we spoke about, which is the need to be open to experience, like Mira Nair and Bill Viola and Richard Ford, to let in what is outside of you. And you have chosen to do that because you're here wanting a new experience to help change you. And that is one key thing of how creativity works. Another facet of that is the need to take a break. In ways, what Richard Serra talks about, about the four o'clock problem, is a kind of connection to the need to be open, that when you're focused so intently on something, you need to step back and, again, fill yourself up before you go back 
to the hard work of making something up. Another essential way that creativity works is that you must engage with your challenges and know that the things that make life most difficult, such as Richard Ford's dyslexia or Chuck Close's prosopognosia, that these things that cause struggle may actually be what shapes your unique vision. And also, again, a connection to know that conflict, that the friction is often where the growing edge is. And like Denise Scott Brown and Robert Venturi, the fight, the struggle, is where something new is going to happen. Finally, you need to stick to your guns, that a passionate obstinacy, which includes, as Joel Meyerowitz says, a passionate optimism, is an essential piece of how creativity works. It may not be very comfortable, but it's necessary for something new to happen. And I'm gonna leave you with the last piece, which is something we can think of as our own creative selves and also as educators, as parents, we can think about how do we nurture this in other people. And that is something that David Plowden began with. I think always about his story about his mother, where, she said, where he said, no one understood what I was doing, and she didn't either, but she said, let him figure it out. She was my champion. And I think as creative people, we need to look for champions, and we need to be champions. I know I'm really grateful that I have been able to share all of these things with you today. Thank you so much. And we have a chance now to take questions. Thank you, you've been a wonderful audience. Um, we have microphones at the two sides of the auditorium. So if anybody has a question, because this is all being webcast, so they really would love to have you on mic to be able to ask questions. Um, it looks like those may be wireless mics, so if you can't get up, you can also ask me and I can repeat the question. If it's too hard for you to get up, I think you can ask from your seat. Yep. But I would love to answer questions. Does anybody have any questions? Come on, your teachers. You know what that's like. Yes, do you want to, are you comfortable getting up and going? Or go ahead. They're gonna, they're gonna move the mic to you. Excellent. So thank you. I know it's like that moment of. Did any artists you talked to tell any of the negative experiences that they had with creativity? Like, did they talk about it as something that they didn't like, or did they squash the creativity? Like, was it the must to avoid, perhaps? Yes. Uh, you know, I think uh, as I was preparing this, I was thinking about that. Like Chuck Close does talk about this was not in the book, but this is something I read somewhere else. He talks about having teachers who basically said to him, you really, you can't do this. Excuse me, you're, you're not gonna amount to anything. And so that was really a moment of, how am I going to make this work? But he always had the support of his parents. So that was one piece. Richard Ford talks about how he really hated reading. He hated it, he didn't, he read for information. That was it. And it was only in his teens when he read Faulkner that he understood that the words on the page were not just to convey information, but that there were all these other things going on. And so for him, had he just stuck with reading for information, he would never have become the novelist he became. So there was that. I think that, and, and David Plowden also having all of his relatives say, this is crazy. You know, the guy went to Yale and now he's working as a conductor? Why is he doing this? And, and just knowing that his mother said, okay, just do what you need to do. So you are in this unique position of being able to not squash those things. You may not know what it is 
you need to say, but as long as you leave the opportunity open for people. Any other questions? Yes? Do you? Well, I, I'm not exactly sure how to word this. That's okay. I mean, we are a, we're in a nation of high stakes testing and, you know, grades yes. everything, the ACT, the advanced placement, you must get into the best colleges or you will never succeed in life. And as a teacher, I'm an English teacher, sometimes I get very frustrated by this because from the top down, they tell us, oh, you need to be teaching writing like this because this is how the ACT scores it. This is how the college board scores it. And I find that oftentimes as a teacher, some of my creativity is quashed. What's that, like, how do we kind of get around that and, you know, without being disrespectful to our administrators or, I mean, like, I'll stand up, but yes. then I also get, you know, beaten down too. That is such a good question, and I wish I had an easy answer for you. And I'm seeing it as a parent now, because I have a 16-year-old who's going through all of this. But he has learning disabilities, so he's in a school that teaches the kids, not the tests, because these kids wouldn't be able to manage otherwise. Some of them would. Um, you know, a lot of artists talk about the framework within which they have to do their work. And I know as a producer, as a radio producer too, often you have these expectations and it is that fine line between fulfilling the expectations but also doing what you think needs to be done. And it is a really complicated dance and can be really frustrating. Um, it sounds like you're, you're, in the pers you're able to be obstinate when you need to be but also sometimes need to say, all right, I will do it this way. But I... Um, I applaud you for trying, because it is very hard. But I also feel you're doing the right thing, because without the ability to go beyond the structure, we're going to be such a poorer nation. So um, if there's anything that artists can do to help with that, I'm sure they would be willing to try. Sorry, I didn't give you a... fine arts program. It's dying. Mm. I mean, we just won the Kennedy Center Award for Fine Arts in the United States. Wow. Our enrollment in art, in sculpture, in photography, and in theater is way down. Way and down. The, the reason is the school, the, the school board and the school administration, they want to push everybody into AP Mm. And the students don't have time for these electives. Mm. And they think it's okay to have a, an introductory theater class of 50 kids, as opposed to it used to be like 20. And so, you know, uh, you know, when I talk to my colleagues who are in the fine arts department, they're just frustrated as I'll get out. But, you know, they're just like these lone cries in the wilderness. And when other uh, departments jump on board, same thing. You know, and they say, oh, we do value this. Oh, these kids aren't taking advanced placement. Is there a way, and you may already be doing this, but as an English teacher to infuse theater into what yeah, you do? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> it's not you, it's the kids, so. <laughs> Are there other, teach other questions? Yes. Um, just a clarification, the author, you said Donald Hall? Yes. Can you spell his last name? H-A-L-L. -L. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. Yes, yeah, the, he's a poet. Yeah. Um, anyone else? How much do you think those talents go into your creativity? I, mean, I, believe, <coughs> I believe you can teach you know, creative thought, I really do. But then there's some people who are born with innate abilities to think in different ways and just, you know, and, and we call it probably a disability, but they were, you know, born that way. But, you know, is there a, how much of it is innate? You know, what, what is that part of it? What, did you, what do you think? Based There's on such argument these days about that, about what is in us and what can we actually learn. And there are, and I think I fall on this side, there is the, the side that says, all of us are born creative. You know, to learn as a baby, you have to be creative. You have to 
uh, someone at the last time I spoke, someone said, well, what is creativity? And I thought for a minute and thought it really is at the bottom, making something that hasn't existed before or making something out of nothing. And if you think about the development of kids, they're doing it just as every other child has done it, but they're not learning from anybody else. They're just learning from life. And I think that there is that room to be creative in everyone. It just needs to be encouraged. And it may not be, you know, world-class level. It may not be that you're going to be able to paint a picture that will be in the Smithsonian or write a book that's going to be in the Library of Congress. But creativity is something we all need in all pieces of our life to engage with any kind of challenge or problem. Because, and this may get back to that first question, we think that there are rules and if we do X, Y, and Z, we'll be able to do the, whatever it is that's required of us. But there's always Q and P and J and something that came from another place that you then have to respond to that isn't part of what you had expected. And that's creativity, too. So I, I think everyone has that in them. But as you say, it's, it's creating a space in which you can nurture that. who were going to be highlighted or yes and did, ha, what about musicians I was looking for some musicians you know it was interesting I as there are musicians in the book but the stories yeah I have in the book Yo-Yo Ma is in the book talking about his ritual which is every day he begins by playing the Bach unaccompanied cello suites Every morning, that's what he does. It's sort of a touchstone for him. So that's his ritual, his way of getting to work. And also, the, um, the musicians, Robert Plant and Alison Krauss, who collaborated a couple of years ago on a Grammy award-winning um, album, Raising, uh, ra what is it called? Raising Sand? I can't remember exactly the name of it. They um, talk about coming from two very different places, from rock and roll and from um, bluegrass and coming together and the, the way that the differences in their voices meshed to create something new. But for this talk, there were other things that I needed to have the artist talk about, but you're absolutely right, music is an essential piece here and that's true. We just have time for one more, one more question. Or oh, we have two, can we take... <laughs> uh, Thank you. Um, what are some of your rituals that you engage in that help inspire your creativity? You know, my big ritual is I, I love voices and stories and, and radio. I've always loved working in radio, but my secret life is as a potter, and I need the balance of those two things, the kind of intellectual, the, the close listening, and then being able to go away, I take a class, but go away by myself and just get my hands really dirty. And so that for me is one of the things that, and I, for a long time I thought, oh, these are so different and I should just focus on one and not the other. And then I realized I needed both. I needed the physical world of clay and I needed the, the human contact of radio and stories. So I think it's, recognizing, okay, I need both of those. Yes. I'm just curious, the stories were wonderful and you, you had such a process in going along with all these people and hearing their, their background and what they were thinking and feeling. Um, what's the one part from all of that experience that still when you stand back and process still astonishes you about the creative process um, mm. with all these people? You know, this isn't exactly an answer to that question, but maybe it is. What I've found so interesting for myself is I write in a way that I come from the stories. That's always what starts it for me. And so often I don't see the bigger patterns until after I've written. Um, and that's true in the radio work that I do too. And as I was putting this together over the weekend, I stood back from it in a way I hadn't before, and I realized so much of what I'm talking about here relates to what's happened over the last 10 years. That, that was when the show was broadcast, but I could have done something that talks about art anytime, but that 
I really kept going back to loss and ruin and the pieces that we then are left with and what do we do with those. And that surprised me, partly because I didn't think about that intentionally when I put this talk together, but as I did it, and I think that's the mysterious part of creativity, is that you go to your material and you listen to what it says to you. And I think a lot of artists would say this too, often you don't know what you're doing till you're done. So, and it's letting yourself be okay with the uncertainty of, I'm not sure this is gonna work or not, but let me keep moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you all. It was great to speak with you.